Welcome to Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. Today, we're going to be hearing from a few of our directors of academic advising, as well as Susan Hawkins Wilding on the new required advising initiative here at Ivy Tech. And one of the things that Susan said at the state board meeting that I had the opportunity to hear is that while we think about required advising, about sort of a mandatory activity for students, it's really more about the relationship and helping make sure that our students have multiple people on campus that they have relationships with. So I'm excited to dive into this conversation and to learn a little bit more about required advising and what the future looks like for us. So let's meet our panel. And first up is Samantha Manier. Hi, Samantha. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Ivy Tech? Sure. I'm the director of academic advising at the Sellersburg campus. We have about 13 advisors in our office, and I think we are ready to go. We're excited for required advising. Excellent. Very good. And Amanda Owen. Hello, Amanda. Hello. My name is Amanda Owen. I am the director of academic advising and transfer advocate for the Central Indiana Service Area. Mm -hmm. And we have about 42 academic advisors in our student or in our service area. And um, we too are very excited about required academic advising. Excellent. And Jenny Leonard. Hi, Jenny. Hi, I'm Jenny Leonard. I'm the director of academic advising at the Kokomo campus. We have a smaller team. We have about five academic advisors, including myself, and I have a small caseload um, as well. And we have a pretty solid plan, I think, to launch required advising. And we're very optimistic. Very good. It's interesting to hear how that sort of shifts as we go around the table. That That's part of something new. And Susan Hawkins-Wilding. Hi, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Hawkins-Wilding. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Academic Advising. And one of the things that's really exciting right now happening with required advising is students are hearing about it. And we got some great feedback on our Microsoft Teams this week. We're chatting with each other and they're, they're calling. Students are calling and seeking out their advisors to make appointments which for us for spring is super early. Mm -hmm. And so we're really excited about driving them into the supports before they need it, mm -hmm. not after they, they need it. So excellent. Excellent. That made me think of a question I'm going to add to the list of questions I already have for you today. So I'll, I'm going to try to remember it. Um, what are we hoping to accomplish with required advising? I gave the little preview of what I've heard you say, but for, for all of you, what are you hoping to accomplish with required advising? So we know that students encounter barriers every semester, even those students who are doing well and may not be on financial aid probation or academic probation, there are still barriers and challenges that they encounter. So the hope is, one of the hopes is that students will come to us early and allow us to be that, that resource, that connector for students to help them be successful. In addition to building relationships, um, students with a connection on campus are more likely to be retained, more likely to be successful. And then, of course, completion, um, timely completion of their academic goals, whether it's a CT, a TC, or a degree, um, the advisor can check to make sure that they're on track, taking the classes that will meet the requirements for their degree and ensure a timely completion, saving them time and money. I think... Our students don't know what they don't know. And by requiring academic advising, that gives us an opportunity to guide them and, and tell them things that we know they need to know so that they can be successful in their classes and go out and earn their degree and get their job and do really what they came to Ivy Tech to, to learn how to do. I think we're really excited about it really for two reasons that stick out in my head. First off, many times the students that we're meeting with, they are just thinking about the semester we're in or the next semester. And, you know, we help them get registered for those semesters. But with this, I think it's easier for us and easier for them to see the big picture and the goal that they have in mind for completing this program and what's next for them. So um, the required advising will help the students with that. They can think about this semester, but they can also think about the big picture and where they hope to end up at the end of all this journey. The second piece that I think is beneficial for both the students and our advisors is that relationship piece. For many of our students, we may be the first and or only person that they have in their lives that is a cheerleader, an advocate, somebody for them that is going to help them figure out what's next for them and where they can go. And the advisors really appreciate and, and crave that kind of connection with our students, mm -hmm. too. So this is really a benefit to both our students and our advisors. Absolutely. 
in each of your introductions, you talked about how many advisors you have. And I think that gets to one of the concerns we all have, which is about capacity, um, because this really does sort of change the way we have students use this. So how are you each planning to handle the capacity on your campus? And Susan, maybe from a statewide perspective, talk about that a little bit. So our campus plan in Kokomo, which we have the the smaller number of advisors, at least among the group here, um, our advisors have been working to increase the number of students who have academic plans. And we have a new report in Newt that we've been using to help us identify our current students that have academic plans or don't have academic plans um, and how far out that they are planned. It also tells us if their plan matches their academic program. So we're using that report and filtering it in a bunch of different ways to figure out who do we need to be creating plans with and for so that they are ready. And then we have a a group of uh, support staff who are helping us to add pin referrals in Ivy Advising. And we took an idea from Indianapolis and we're going to be doing an email merge to students who have a plan, whose plan is for the program that they're declared in, who don't have any SAP financial Mm -hmm. aid academic standing issues, and we will go ahead and email merge that PIN number to those students. It's a great idea. Um, and then on the back end, go back and add that PIN mm-hmm. referral so that they have it Excellent. available there too. So, With as large as our service area is in central Indiana, um, we really had to think long and hard about how we would address the volume that this would drive into the office. So um, as Jenny mentioned, we're usually using the newt reports to try to get ahead of planning out academic plans for students who haven't even come into the office for a mm-hmm. visit with advisors and then emailing that plan to students and saying, here you go, here's your, your academic plan and your PIN number. And if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. Mm-hmm. We'd still love to see you. We are doing the mail merge email for the the students who are in good academic and SAP standing to send them their pins via email. Mm -hmm. We also have kind of re-implemented group advising for our students and we're doing that uh, school specific. Um, So every month there are two sessions per school and one of the sessions is specifically designed for new students and one of them is designed for current or returning students. And we've been very fortunate to have very great relationships with our Express Enrollment Center and with our career development CCEC Alpha site where they have come in. And part of that has been for the new students, they're actually completing the Indiana Career Explorer as Mm -hmm. part of that group advising piece. Um, And for the current students, they're doing some of those other assessments that the CCEC offers. The other piece that we have really thought about is um, when do our students need to see advisors? And for some of our students, appointments during the regular nine to six business hours that we're here just aren't feasible, even if it's a phone or a Zoom interview or, excuse me, appointment. Um, So we have advisors that are working at an alternate work location, usually from home, Mm -hmm. that are having evening hours. We have one advisor that works Sundays and Mondays um, from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Wow, that's great. uh, Virtual distance advising appointments, Mm -hmm. either via phone or Zoom. Um, And then we have another that works from 11 to 7 p.m. on Mm -hmm. Monday. So really trying to meet the students where they are as far as their availability. That's fantastic. I think all of us um, statewide are focusing on academic completion plans as a tool to help us Mm -hmm. manage the capacity for required advising. And this is a conversation that we've had in directors meetings for a year or more. So in Sellersburg, we have had an advising wig the past two semesters to increase the number of ACPs for students. But additionally, in the beginning of summer, we had a simplex around required advising for all of the advisors and other leaders on campus to see how might we manage capacity on our campus. And so what came of that were three task forces were created within my office. Uh, The three big issues that we saw that that could um, inhibit or be a, a challenge for required advising were How might we prioritize our day? Because everything we do is important. So Mm -hmm. how do we pick what is the most important thing in serving students? The second task force was how might we improve our no-show rate? So not wasting an appointment for a student who habitually no-shows. And then the third one was how might we be more efficient in our appointments and make sure that those are 
are being used to the to the best benefit of our time and the students time. So we came up with three task forces. These task forces have been working on strategies for implementation. We've started some effective this week that we're going to be doing differently to manage capacity. And I think from a statewide perspective, Samantha mentioned it, you know, we've been planning this for a year and looking at this for a year. When we started this, we didn't even know really how many students had academic plans because we didn't have a good report. And we we built this report and continuously tweaked it based on the needs of the campuses that mm-hmm. really great leadership from our directors and leads providing us um, insight in what they needed. And, and frankly, IT being very willing and adaptable when we'd ask for yet another field or whatever that helped us sort. And so... You know, we started probably 10% of our students with academic plans that were up to date. And our goal that we, I think, will easily meet for March and spring term is that, you know, we have 75% of our students with up-to-date plans. And what that means is, do you have a plan that lets you know what you need to take in the next term? Because then we've met with you already and you've got that goal, at least to that very next. Our ultimate goal is to get plans to completion. And there's a lot of other work that the college is doing with completion guides and of course, scheduling software and things like that, that that will help us get there. But one of those pieces that we were just actually talking about in a meeting that we had earlier today is students are are more likely to um, complete something and be retained when they see that ultimate goal. What is the benefit to them? So talking about what um, Amanda was talking about uh, from a career perspective, um, but also a planning perspective, and how will this help us do a better job of offering the courses when with how many we need and when we need them. And so I feel like there's been a lot of work being done and that also not every student has to come in and see an advisor. What can we do to see them, you know, virtually or to speak to them ahead of time? We have several months before we, you know, that January rush again. And so all that work that these folks are talking about at the table is helping us help students be, you know, be better planners themselves and Mm -hmm. have incremental goals. So we feel pretty confident about the work that we've done this past year. I think a lot of people that work in higher education, certainly not all of us, but a lot of us, higher education was fun for us. We went back to school because we didn't really ever want to leave it. Um, And so we might not have used the services of academic advising offices or we haunted their halls all the time. One of those two, because we either felt deeply engaged or we were like, oh, this is just you make a plan and you act on it. So for those of us who work in the field, we don't always have a good understanding of what advising is. So can you just talk about for our student population who a vast majority of them, they are first generation college students. They they don't necessarily come to us with a lot of self-confidence. What what does academic advising do for students who aren't like us? So I can I can add to that because last night I was working on my advising philosophy um, as part of a certified advisor training and I was reflecting back on my experience as a student and I was a first generation student and I picked my major because it was my favorite class slash teacher in high school, which is fine. It means I will be interested in the curriculum that I will be learning, but is that really the best way to choose my future life path. You know, the next four years might be interesting, but what about the next 40 after that? So I was thinking, I wish I had better engaged with my advisor or some resource on campus that would have asked me those questions. Like, well, what what career choice would you prefer? Do you want to work with people or would you prefer to work in a desk behind a wall with nobody talking to you? Or, you know, what, what are your strengths and where, where do you see yourself playing out those strengths in the big picture in the long term. And and so it's funny you ask that question, because for me, I would have liked to have had that person to have that conversation that maybe my support system was not equipped to have with me. And then to help me find those alternate paths or other ways that I could have pursued higher education. I'm happy where I'm at. It turned out okay for me. But what about those other students that might need a little more support, guidance, insight into their future career? I think a lot of what academic advisors are doing is listening to students who have returned to college or have come to college as a new student or a first generation student, um, trying to understand what is it that you're here to accomplish and what are the ways that we can help you accomplish exactly that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a student will sit down in front of an advisor and say, my major is medical assisting and I want to be a surgeon someday. And the advisor (laughs) would say, 
that's a really great major, but if you want to be a surgeon someday, maybe we need to talk about some different majors. So listening to their goals and, and trying to hear what, what aligns and where are the discrepancies and how can we get this student on a pathway that gets them where they really want to be and keeping them on that pathway, even though we know that there will be changes and there will be things that happen. Um, so it's a lot of goal setting, whether it be career goals or academic goals. And a lot of it is related to keeping them eligible for financial aid too and helping students. That's the thing I think students don't understand very well is, well, I did my FAFSA and it says that I don't have any, that I don't have to pay for anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, you did your FAFSA, that's great, good first step. But let's talk about how you academically keep your financial aid, mm -hmm. even though your FAFSA says that you qualify do you academically qualify? So I think a lot of it is just helping them navigate all of the things. That's great. I think sometimes there's this misperception about academic advising and advisors that we just register students for classes. Mm -hmm. And that that is always a part of our conversation with students. Here are the classes that you should take. Here's your, your academic completion plan. But I sit right out, but outside of where our advisors sit in their cubicles. And so I, I overhear a lot of advising appointments and that is an important part of it. But more often than not, um, they're having conversations about childcare, about transportation, about serious life issues that for these students feel like hurdles that they can't possibly overcome to complete this journey. And I think a big part of what our advisors do is connect students with services that can help keep them in school and help keep them working towards their goals. Um, you know, we oftentimes use the phrase here in central Indiana that for many of our students, life just happens and we never see them again. They, they withdraw from all their classes or don't just walk away in the middle of the night and, and never come back to campus. And, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about in regard to the required academic advising piece is now we have a chance to work with those students who may think that something has happened and they can't possibly continue to help get them connected with the people in departments on campus that can help them stay here and help them complete and help them achieve their goals. That's it's such a great point because I don't think students always see us as a resource. Absolutely. I think they see us as people telling them what to do yes. when what we want is to be a resource for them to help them be successful. And I think that's such a really, really good point. I think too, on that, to kind of go back with what's, you know, looking back on my own path, you know, I, I was a first generation college student and there's this, feeling that I was going to be fine. And so if you look like you're a relatively decent student, you're, you coast through and I, I, I did okay. I graduated. Right. Mm -hmm. But what could I have achieved if I had a mentor or someone who told me all the things mm -hmm. I didn't know as a first generation college student, there are scholarships I missed out on because I was not aware that I would have qualified for, for healthcare because I supported myself. And mm -hmm. I mean, just like something like that, what would that have income wise, I was working three jobs to put myself through, what could that have done for me to be able to be engaged more on campus or to yeah. have tried something else or gone and done in some kind of internship? So, I mean, that's just one really specific example mm -hmm. of, of how those connections on campus can really help you mm -hmm. as a student. And like, you know, Ginny said that you don't know what you don't know. I mean, think about your own self, what you know, I'm continuously learning and things that I don't know about financial aid and stuff like that. And so imagine our students. And so I think the biggest thing I would want to leave us with of what advising is, is what Nakata says advising is. Advising is teaching and learning. We have learning outcomes mm -hmm. for advising. If you don't know them, we'd be happy to show you them. And we have goals for what we want a student to, to learn and achieve. Ultimately, it's completion, but there are things within that that is what we're, hope, we're hoping to partner in, a, in an academic and co-curricular way. Excellent. Very good. I think most of our listeners know that we record a series of episodes on the same day. And so in one of the other episodes we recorded earlier today, we talked about how at Ivy Tech quite often we're building the plane while we're flying it. And that is, we often say it as a criticism, um, and but it's also just a part of when you're this large of an organization, if you want to innovate and you want to implement change, you have to do that while you're continuing to do all the other things you're doing. So something all of you talked about as you were doing your 
um, intros is that this is changing the patterns in your offices to drive students in earlier. We also introduced a kind of big thing at Ivy Tech called eight-week courses that also probably changed some of the patterns in your offices. So can you talk about what the benefits and the challenges are of that changing pattern that you're already seeing and what you're worried about as you think about that moving forward? So I think now there there is just a steady flow of constant work all the time. And I often feel like I don't know what semester I'm in or what day of the week mm-hmm. I'm in because we're in fall, but we're registering for spring or we're mm-hmm. in spring and registering for summer and fall. And um, students too, you know, they're mm-hmm. during spring or fall break, we're registering for second eight weeks and the following term. So it really is making sure that your brain is synced up to what you need to do and, and making sure that you have kind of a system and plan in place. Mm-hmm. And it is constant. Stu- we want to register students for first and second eight weeks mm-hmm. at one registration appointment, advising mm-hmm. appointment. But oftentimes they come back multiple times for multiple mm-hmm. registration um, events. So so there's a constant flow of activity and there is no really downtime for administrative work. It's working with students all the time, which is what we love. We like to see that. But again, scheduling efficiency, making sure we're more efficient in what we're doing. And I think academic plans can be a good piece of that. I would agree with what Samantha said. The downtime that I think we experienced as advisors maybe four or five years ago, we would feel like, okay, it's it's quiet now. Mm-hmm. And usually right after the start of the semester, once the the ad drop period ended, it's it's a ghost town and it goes from being absolutely wild to to scarce. Mm -hmm. And we're not seeing that as much. We still have students now that are coming in with eight week classes because, okay, I heard that I could add this class in the Mm -hmm. second eight weeks. Or also, hey, I just got this email that says I need a PID number. So I thought I'd stop by today and see what that is. And so that that kind of ghost town that we used to kind of count on we don't have that anymore. We don't have this two weeks before registration opens to work on all the things we didn't work on prior to the semester starting. We just have to fit it in and figure out how to be more efficient. I will agree with what everyone has just said in how we're managing all of this. I think we're still building the plane as we're (laughs) flying in too. Um, We, we knew all these things were coming and for months and months I've been talking in staff meetings about doing the plans and putting the pin referrals on and everyone's been doing it. And I've been telling the advisors, you know, the pin process isn't anything new for health and nursing students. Mm -hmm. And so our health and nursing advisors calendars have traditionally been booked out two to three weeks in advance. And I think it's, and I've said, everyone's calendars are going to start to look like that. And I think it's just one of those things that until it actually happens, you don't know what that's going to be like. And so I think that that's challenging, especially for folks who were here that five year ago time where we did have a downtime and now it's like downtime. What's that? But I think what this has really helped us to do, and I was just in a meeting um, about this earlier this week, we were debriefing about how August had gone and We'd, we were talking about the fact that we were being much more responsive and nimble to looking at where we were in the cycle and what we needed to do. And do we need to plan an event for two days from now? And how can we market this? And getting all the people at the table who needed to be involved in that conversation and the willingness for people to jump in and say, we're going to have a registration celebration on Friday. Great. Let's get there early and blow up balloons and put out confetti and hang up streamers. True story. Um <laughs> But that really, I think, has really fostered a lot of collaboration and ability to just jump in and make things happen quickly when we saw that there was a need for something. I think from the perspective of it, of, of that downtime is what that's important to that you hear is that that gave us time to be proactive and reach out to students then in the third and fourth week that we thought mm-hmm. we didn't get to see or catch up on all the emails that we're behind on and phone calls that we're behind on. And so when they're talking about that, it's not downtime like that we're, we're sitting there not doing anything. Right. It's, it's the time to be proactive. And and I think the shift in the thinking is, is that we're, we've we already been proactive and, and having to be comfortable about that, but also all those other things that you didn't get to, how do you nook and cranny it? It mm-hmm. speaks to what Samantha was saying about if a student doesn't come in, 
then that's an hour you could return calls or you can catch up on plans and things like that. Being very intentional about our work so that we can, you know, advising is a very counseling heavy profession. We are helping students with some very serious challenges in their life and there's burnout. And so being efficient so that we also can step away to recharge at our homes and things like that is very important, but also rethinking of how, when we're reaching out to students and, Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you're hearing, I think, just to put put a framework on that mm-hmm. of it's shifting the work of when we see students and maybe even that we're going to see them more. So it is it is different capacity. So we got to do groups and things like that. But maybe we're not seeing more. It's when we're seeing them and how we do it. All right. If I am a faculty member on a campus or I'm another staff member on a campus, what can I do to get involved or to learn more about required advising? I'm asking the faculty and the staff on our campus to to just be talking to students about having an academic completion plan. In our directors meetings um, for student affairs, so enrollment services and student success, the directors get together and I've been asking them for a few months now, please ask your teams to ask every student they encounter, do you have an academic plan? Do you know how to find your academic plan? Have you heard this is happening? Because a group of five advisors, six including me, um, but my caseload is half their sizes. It is hard for us to reach all of the students when we have three locations in our service area with this news. We're hoping they're reading their email. We're hoping they're reading their text messages. We're hoping they see the announcements on um, Ivy Learn, but we're also really counting on our colleagues to spread the news with us. The leads in our office and myself, um, we've been working very closely with our partners in academic affairs, our deans, our program chairs, and we've really been trying to think creatively about how we can reach out to students where they already are. So we've been working with faculty adjunct and full-time and and program chairs. And we've been going into classrooms and doing classroom presentations where we will actually run a degree audit and create a, an academic completion plan with their pins neatly at the top. So when registration opens, they can go ahead and get registered for the upcoming semester or semesters. We've also been working with faculty where we will reserve a computer lab near their classrooms and they've either been sending their whole class down or sending students one or two at a time down to meet with advisors in that lab to have kind of a mini advising appointment, get their degree audit done and their academic completion plan done and get registered. And it's been great. It always makes my heart happy when I hear program chairs or faculty or deans saying that they're embedding this as assignments into their courses where you have to go meet with your advisor, get your academic completion plan and print out a copy of your schedule Mm -hmm. that you're registered for the next semester and you'll get your points for this assignment. You know, some students are just going to do it anyway. Others may need to be prompted by the fact that it's a graded assignment in a course, Mm -hmm. but either way we're getting to the same outcome. Um, And so we've really been, Um, working closely with our faculties and and deans and program chairs and academic affairs to think about ways that we can reach large groups of students at one time. That's wonderful. I would encourage faculty not to underestimate their uh, capacity as an influencer. Mm -hmm. So students will look to them as um, for their opinions and perspectives on any initiative that happens. And so uh, the goal of required advising really is to build those relationships, to make that connection on campus and to increase the retention rates of the students that we have. So share that message, share the why with your students and encourage those appointments, either with their faculty or staff advisor to make sure that they're on track and they have a connection to campus. And for the staff and advisors, I would just say, um, I would encourage you that you, you've been doing this all along. You've got this. Don't be intimidated by what numbers we might see. Uh, we, we have a plan and we're going to work that plan and it's going to be okay. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we're, we have great people at Ivy Tech. We, we have amazing people that are really committed to our students. And that, that, that power of that influencer and why the why is so important. And so do you, do you know the why? Can you help the student understand the why? Can you connect them to, to their faculty advisor or their academic advisor? But also then we're all on the same page. And if we're doing the, that work together as a team, we're, 
supporting each other and working smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we work harder than we need to <laughs> because we aren't doing a great job communicating or reaching out to students in those those ways to be efficient. And so I think, you know, what you can do to help is all the things that everybody has also said. But when you have a question or if you don't understand something, don't suffer in silence. Uh, you have some great people on your campus or even myself, please reach out to us and um we we edited and tweaked this plan because of the feedback that we received from people, so many people on campus, things we didn't think of that they thought of. And so we can't do it without you is what I would say. You know, I was in a meeting the other day with a faculty member. It, it was our retention team on campus. And one of our faculty members said, I have the advisors come into my classroom and do the presentation. And she said, I always introduce the advisors by saying, these are my friends from academic advising. And that's such a small thing. But I think it goes so far with the students and saying, we're a team here and we work to, we're working together to help you be successful. I just want to give you all kudos, and I, I know you're here for a director's meeting, so I'll go in and interrupt Corey in a second. I think he's speaking right now. Um, give the whole team kudos, because I know one of the things that you all do is you're continuously improving. We are, um, Sue's been using the term, we're going to stub our toe a few times when we're out on the road talking about things. We'll stub our toe with required advising a few times. We know we will because it's new and we're learning right along with everybody else. Um, but I, I have in, incredible faith that our academic advisors across the state will learn from everything that happens, all the good stuff and the few things where we go, hmm. We can make that a little bit better um, and you'll do it. So I just appreciate the leadership you all are showing because this is hard to think about what we're doing here is not easy and it's exciting and it's amazing. But I really appreciate the work you all are doing and on behalf of all of our advisors across the state. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Every episode ends with a call to action. And today I would like to encourage you to check out the academic advising resources that are available to you on my Ivy. They're on the, both the faculty resources and the employee resources tab. And there's a lot of really great information out there. Some of it that I've looked at those buttons a lot of times and I don't realize they're there until I actually click on them. So my call to you is go click on every one of those buttons and just see all the things you have access to because you really do have a lot of access to information. I want to thank the panel today. Samantha Manier, Amanda Owen, Jenny Leonard, and Susan Hawkins-Wilding. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a lot of fun to have you here. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. You can connect with me on Twitter at KNM Tweets. Our producer is Ann Penny Valentine. Ann is on Twitter at Indie Penny. You can reach us by email if you have show ideas or questions about this or any episode at Our College Your Voices at ivytech.edu. Leave us a voicemail at 317-572-5049. Our website, where you can check out this and all of our past episodes, is www.ivytech.edu slash podcast. Promotion assistance for this and every episode is provided by Becky Campbell, Sarah DeWitt and the Ivy Tech Community College marketing team. And our podcast concept is by Matthew Pittman. If you're an Ivy Tech employee, don't forget you can connect with us on Microsoft Teams by going out to Teams and clicking on the listener community for our college or voices. Our theme music, recording, and post-production services are provided by the amazing Jen Eads from the Brassy Broadcasting Company. And we will talk to you next time on Our College, Your Voices.